Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Hello again. This is Gary Stearman, and it's time for another study with Stearman. And we're going to go into the fourth chapter of the first epistle of John. First John 4 uh, is an amazing, amazing uh, statement of Christ versus Antichrist. And it's just, well, you'll see when we get into it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for your word, uh, for your spirit uh, guiding us through it. And we just uh, hope and pray that your word will come to be a living reality worldwide and very, very soon. <laughs> we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First John 4. <clears throat> Somebody has called First John 4 the antidote to fear. Ever get a little bit afraid? Yes. Everybody, you know, occasionally I watch what's happening in the world and <clears throat> I'm saying if this happens and this and this and then this and this, we are toast. And then there are all those nuclear weapons just waiting to be launched. And then there are people who would strip us of our livelihood and there are enemies and there are people who are out to destroy the economy and and so you could go this way for maybe an hour and a half and you'd have a stomach ache and this chapter in first john chapter four is the antidote to fear and a lot of people have called it that also, it continues the use of the word love, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, that is, test or trust the spirits to see that they are of God. In other words, make certain that your communication with God through Christ is what it should be. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. In other words, you need to be following the right Christ. Uh, there are antichrists. And that is so sad. And you say, why does that have to be? Because God allowed it. He permitted it for his own ultimate blessing of this world. And you say, how does that work? Well, read the Bible. <laughs> It's a long read, but it's worth it. And verse 2 says about those prophets, false prophets that have gone out uh, into the world, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. <clears throat> wow, that's easy. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. What does that mean exactly? What that means is the Lord Jesus Christ came into human flesh as the divine Son of God entering into flesh and living here for 33 years in flesh but all those 33 years, and even during his crucifixion, and, and as he rose back to be with the Father, even then, he was come in the flesh. Now, that's astonishing. The greatest miracle in the history of the world is the fact that God incarnated in human flesh. <clears throat> Think about this. Who is God? Well, God is that undescribable, indescribable living creature who built the galaxies and the universe and time and space and matter and motion and all of the laws of mathematics and created life. That's, that's God. And that God came into human flesh lived in Nazareth, fulfilled what he came to do. 
and it's staggering. I mean, just to think that thought, but then when you go into detail about what he really did, that's even more staggering. He came into a wicked, evil world, and the world smacked him down, thinking, well, we've gotten rid of him, and he rose again on the third day. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses, confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Then in other words, if, God, if you confess that God came into human flesh, lived for 33 years, your thoughts are of God. Verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Now there are many alternate Jesus figures that have been posited down through uh, the years since he rose again and, and ascended to heaven. Uh, false Christs abound in every country on earth. They are carved into tree trunks. They are made into little bronze statues. They are this, they are that. There are false Christs of every kind, including false interpretations of Christ that are rather constantly forwarded to us. Uh, false representations of Christ are born of not really understanding the Word of God. Every spirit that confesseth not, this is verse 3, that Jesus Christ is come of the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist. So there is a spirit of Antichrist, and I think that there have been many little Antichrists. Back in the days of Rome, everybody thought that Nero was an Antichrist. That is, the early Christians kind of tacked that label on him. And he was an Antichrist, not the Antichrist. But down through the last couple thousand years, there have been many Antichrist figures. <clears throat> And that's what it says here in verse 3, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it, it is, in the, is it in the world. So the spirit of Antichrist is in the world, and many people have risen to try to fill that pair of shoes, and uh, not yet, the, the real one. And he's probably out there some, somewhere right now, just waiting. But, but what's going on here? What is John chapter 4 about? Again, we, we stated that it's the antidote to fear. And by the way, right now is a good time to have an antidote to fear. <clears throat> Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in, in the flesh is not of God. It's the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it's in the world. That's back in the days when John was writing. Verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And this is an often uh, memorized verse, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I try to remember that a lot. I include this little verse in my prayers very often. Hey, Gary, remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Whew, that's a relief. Wow. <laughs> really? Seriously? They are of the world, verse 5. Therefore speak they of the world. The world heareth them. The world hears them. These antichrists. The world is listening to the voice of the antichrist. I'm not going to name any. But I could let's see, there's this one, this one, let's see, there's, yeah, I just thought of, what, uh, seven, eight antichrists right now. I'm not going to name their names. There are many antichrists in the world. Who are they? They're the ones that want all the money, all the power, all the weapons. And they look out through the cameras and they smile and say, hi, I'm going to fix the world. It's going to be great. And you know it's not. But Christians have had to deal with this enigma for years. Why does the Lord allow the spirit of Antichrist to, to thrive down through the ages and to take advantage of Christians, to persecute Christians, to martyr Christians? Why does this happen? 
And it's all wrapped up in the word love. <clears throat> they are of the world, verse 5. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Verse 6, we are of God. They are of the world, <clears throat> or the world system. We are of God. And you say, well, I've heard that before. Well, I'm sure you have, but think about it now. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know Hereby know we, I should read, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In other words, we should have discernment. This is a kind of a preamble to what he's going to say in this chapter. The first six verses of John, 1 John chapter 4 are a setup for what's coming. And here's what's coming. <clears throat> Starting with verse 7, the theme kind of shifts. And the theme is love as Christ loved. In other words, model your life after Christ. And here's the way John expresses that. Beloved, verse 7, let us love one another, for, we, for love is of God. By the way, uh, that's the 15th, 16th, and 17th uh, occurrence of the word love in uh, this epistle. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And here, the word or the verb to know is to know with certainty, absolute certainty. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It's a little phrase. <clears throat> and you may have heard me say this before, but I've said it over and over again, <clears throat> that those three words are the most staggering words in the Bible. <clears throat> Twice in 1 John 4, you have that little three-word expression, God is love. Well, now, wait a minute. When I look at the universe, and by the way, I, I used to be a, a really avid amateur astronomer, had a telescope, the whole thing, uh, got out, studied the stars, studied all the uh, planetary orbits and times, and, and I developed this idea of, wow, th this is phenomenal. God created all this. This is beyond my wildest imaginings to, to look at what he's done. <clears throat> And then as I became more and more and more involved in Scripture, I saw that just looking through a telescope wasn't going to do it because what God did was not only create a universe, but he peopled the universe in a very complex way. And his driving impetus was love. <clears throat> and you say, oh, well, that's simple. I never thought of that before. Guess what? Love is something that... If we ever do fully understand it, we will fully understand God, because God is love. Now, what are the odds that God would be love? Think about that. What if God wasn't love? What if he was something else? God is a powerful king, and if you disobey him, he'll whack you. No, God is love. <laughs> and... <clears throat> That's a staggering thought, expressed twice by John. And John knew the incarnate God in Christ, walked with him, and saw that love firsthand. And now he expands it in to the universal level, if you will. God is love. That's... I still stagger when I hear that. In this, verse 9, was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. God sent His only begotten Son into 
the world only. <clears throat> Mind you, only means only. Uh, you look at the universe again, what do you have? Trillions of galaxies, planets, stars, whatever. <clears throat> And you look back toward our solar system and, and then look at the Earth, you know, this little ball of dirt, and what do you see? You see uh, human beings running around, scurrying around, doing what human beings do. And when you compare human beings to the vastness of God's creation, we, we don't come off very big at all. But in this, the fact that God sent His only begotten Son, <clears throat> is manifested the love of God toward us. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not only did God love, but He sent His only begotten Son. Now, only is, uh, again, only in all this universe, and there are Billions, billions of planets, as they used to say, out there, and billions of stars, and wait a minute, of all of that, there was only one Son of God, and He sent Him here to earth, to us, out of all those billions. What's going on here? Way above my pay grade, but what it means is, <clears throat> Jesus not only manifested the love of God toward us, we didn't love God. He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, the word propitiation uh, means atonement. To atone for, to make up for, to do whatever had to be done to cure the sin problem. And, and, and in Christ's case, he gave everything, gave his blood. He gave everything in all the universe. He came here. He shed his blood to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation means expiation. In other words, he got rid of sin. But it does mean, also, in the Old Testament, it, it's expressed as the mercy seat of God. What's the mercy seat? It's the Ark of the Covenant, where the high priest went in once a year and, and placed blood on the altar between the two cherubim to atone for the sins of the 12 tribes once a year. And that propitiation had to be repeated, 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 Jesus came once for all time to be the atonement, the propitiation, the expiation, the absolute be-all and end-all that, that removed our sin. That's, again, one staggering thought after another. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, <clears throat> we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. That's verse 12. And I think that as close as you come is Moses uh, when he was up in the mountain and God was carving the Ten Commandments out. And he, he said, God, let me see you. And God said, no man can see me and live. But I will show you part of myself. And he moved by Moses and Moses saw some part, some very minor, small part of God, for to have seen him in his fullness would mean death. But let's fast forward to Jesus. Jesus is God in human flesh. He came in human flesh and walked among men for 33 years, and they walked with him, they touched him, they ate with him, they had lived their lives with him, and they all saw God. And they all lived. <laughs> That's amazing. Under Moses and law, to see God was to die. Under Jesus was to see God and live. Because God is love. 
<clears throat> Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also to love one another. Well, that makes sense. How do you love one another? Uh, <laughs> that's a long book. That, in fact, that'd be a, a pretty good book title, right on the cover. How do you love one another? Question mark by so and so, and the book is 360 pages long. Except you don't need that, that book. All you need is the Bible, and the examples given of love, which are manifold throughout Scripture. <clears throat> Love, to give of oneself to, at the very heart level, to give that which you have to give openly and honestly to other people. Verse 12, no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And you could also say that his love is completed in us. In other words, you have God, Father, God, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit indwells us. We live with the indwelling Holy Spirit, and our job is to perfect the love of God at the street level, if you will. Tough assignment? Yes but you're up to it in the Spirit. Again, I'm going to read verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another, and no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected or completed in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him. This is verse 13. Hereby, says John, know we... Now, the word know here is a Greek word, a Greek verb that means to recognize. Like, uh, <clears throat> you're trying to figure something. Ever, ever been out in the uh, country, strange place, and you're looking across a field and you see something and you don't know, well, what is that? What is that thing that I'm looking at? And it's kind of moving. And after a while, it, oh, it's a tractor with a hay baler. I've never seen one of those before. <clears throat> At that moment, you recognize the hay baler. Well, that's what we have here. Hereby know we is that word that means to, to figure it out, to have a, a moment of insight. Boom. Oh, so that's what it is. Hereby know we that we dwell in him because and he is in us because he hath given us of his spirit. In other words, we have discernment because we have the spirit of God. <clears throat> Verse 14, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Yes, we do. Verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. We have known, meaning we have intimately known. The Greek uh, verb, ganasko, we know it for sure. <clears throat> and we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love. There it is again. One of two times in the entire Bible that you have the little phrase, God is love. One is in uh, 1 John 4, 8. The other here is in 1 John 4, 16. Eight verses. And it says again, God is love. It's a complete little phrase. Three words that are more important than any other truth re ever revealed to humanity since the foundation of the world. <clears throat> God is love. Think how many people have appropriated love. 
Yes. And uh, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Remember those guys that used to sing that? <laughs> and they had, uh, let's put it this way, a less than perfect view of love because it didn't come from the Bible. When you say God is love, that is the be-all and end-all truth, and everything else descends from that truth. God is love. And the next phrase, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. doesn't take long to figure out <clears throat> what God expects and what Jesus brought to the world, brought down to shoe leather, human flesh. He brought the love of God. This, I must tell you, and I've said this to so many people, I will never understand this as long as I live. Now, after I pass on from this planet and have the opportunity to be in, you know, in the personal presence of Christ and begin to see, I w I'm sure I'm going to have that moment. Aha! So that's what love is. Whoa, I finally figured it out. Right now I have this dim idea based upon what I know of Christ and of God and, and uh, of uh, the Word of God, but one day I'm going to know even as I am known. <clears throat> so, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Boldness means assurance. Do you have assurance that he is with you? Yes. Then you can go ahead and do what needs to be done. Yes, absolutely. Now, here's a statement that may make you tremble just a little bit. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment or uh, punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Here is a vital truth. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So, are you perfect in love? Do you ever have fear? I do. I don't see the love of God to be absolutely perfected in <clears throat> me in terms of relationship. I'm still working on it. Will be all my life. But believe me, it's there and it does work and it is a growing entity and has been all my life. He that Feareth is not made perfect in love. Something to think about, something to meditate on and work with. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Hmm. In other words, love is something that you should think of as a perfectible quantity. That's something that maybe at first you're not so good at it. You haven't incorporated all the attributes. But over the span of your life, it gets better and better and better. And you, you understand what love is because you study the Bible and you and you begin to understand what God is and what he did, and then after a while, this thing becomes ingrained in you. Verse 21, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. And that is what the world needs. The musicians used to sing uh, that song, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. Hey, I wonder where they got that idea. <laughs> I know where I got it, and I know how important it is. Christ, says John, is the mercy seat for our sins. He is the propitiation. He has given 
everything so that we might be uh, forgiven and brought into the family of God as sons. And what should we do? Out of respect for his great act. I think the obvious answer is we should learn to love as he does. And that's 1 John 4. It's an amazing, amazing chapter. Remember those three little words. God is love. I'm Gary Stearman. Thanks for joining me. And we'll see you again soon.